Well, um, speaking about the uh, preferred outcomes for Moscow, I would say that uh, Russia doesn't have a very detailed plan of its exit from Syria. It has, I would say, uh, several um, several aspects that it would like to achieve via its current policy. First of all, it has definitely the military withdrawal, but the withdrawal that it could sell to the Russian public as a victory, a diplomatic, political, military victory. Uh, secondly, it would like to um, uh, preserve its uh, military and economic and political presence in the post-war Syria, which also matters. And finally, thirdly, um, it would also like to see uh, Syria more or less stable. And uh, though this stability might also uh, imply a simmering conflict happening in the country, but at least that would for sure won't spill over these borders. When Russia took a decision about the military intervention in Syria, it definitely miscalculated about uh, its time framework. This mis miscalculation was largely due to the um, absence of correct and exact information about the military capacities of the regime, uh, about probably the lack of perception of how the complex situation was on the ground, and at the end of the day, Moscow um, was to accept the idea that it came to Syria for quite a long period. Uh, when saying about actually the goal pursued by Moscow. I would say that uh, its military intervention so far achieved just one. They managed to stabilize the regime and they managed to eliminate the physical danger to Assad uh, and the Assad regime that exists uh, by the beginning of the Russian military operation. But the second goal, namely to launch the political process that would try to rebuild Syria or at least to uh, ensure that uh, the ceasefire in Syria will be sustainable, is so far uh, unachieved. And that's uh, one of the top priorities of Russia to actually to, to launch this political process. And so far they are pursuing the two-track approach uh, by putting the military uh, pressure on the position on one hand, but on the other hand by periodically offering a diplomatic solution. Uh, the issue is currently that Moscow uh, doesn't believe that uh, time matters for it. Uh, financially and economically it still can allow uh, keeping uh, quite a substantial military force in the country. Uh, it also believes that diplomatically it can uh, to leverage the public opinion inside and outside of the country. And so that's why it believes that it can afford being in Syria as long as necessary. Well, the question about the future of Russian-American cooperation in Syria is still open. Uh, again, there is a huge array of opinions currently existing in Russia. Uh, I personally am quite pessimistic about the future of these relations because uh, I still see that there is a huge mistrust existing among the, the political elites of two countries at a very different level. I also see the difference in the perception on um, actually how to handle the issue of the post-conflict Syria and how it should look like. And finally, I also see the, the difference of actually of perception of the source of, source of threat for the US and for Russia, while for the Russians this threat is largely associated with the Russian-speaking jihadists, for uh, the US is far more associated with Daesh itself, with the radical Islamic grouping uh, itself that originates from the region. And I'm afraid that Moscow is not ready to uh, share the equal burden of fighting with the uh, Arab jihadist grouping. Lastly, Nikolai, let me ask you how you see the Syrian conflict ending eventually. Well, I'm afraid that first of all it's going to be a very long conflict. Uh, it will be a long and sim uh, simmering confrontation of different groupings and uh, given the, the current trends, I would say that we will end up with a physically split Syria that will be divided among different forces and uh, represent as a loose federal, uh, federal state. I should say, unfortunately, I'm not optimistic. I believe the crisis would continue, would deepen, would get worse. 
and I do not see any chance for a real peace. However, if there is genuine efforts by key players, there can be a solution immediately and to resolve the crisis even less than a year. I believe the two big key players, meaning Russia and the US, international players, member of United Nations Security Council, with four key players in the region, Iran, Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt. These six countries, they can sit together to agree about the end state first. Like the nuclear crisis, first they agreed about the end state, the principles, and then they negotiated for 18 months to define each principle. I would say the first principle is to agree and to believe that there would be and there should be a political solution through diplomacy, not war and military solution. Second, we all should agree, we need a face saving solution for all parties. Like, like the nuclear deal, it was really face saving for the US, Europe, port powers, Iran, domestically, regionally, internationally. We should uh, really avoid the notion of uh, winning or, or defeating the competitors in Syria, you know. The second is a real comprehensive war cooperation collectively against terrorism because it is not Syria. It is not the fact Syrian, uh, I mean ISIS, Al-Qaeda, those terrorist groups today they held 60% uh, of Syrian soil. It is about Iraq, it is about Yemen, it is about Afghanistan, it is about even the, the consequences for Europe, for Iran, for the US. We need a collective, non-discriminative war in common cooperation against terrorism. Number fourth, would be to agree to prevent the disintegration of Syria. Because it is not going to stop to Syria if there is disintegration. Therefore, the unity and preserving the, the uh, uh, integrity of Syria would be key. Number five, we have very bad experience from the collapse of army and security establishments in Iraq. You remember? The US uh, invested hundreds of millions or billions to create a new army and at the end, after 10 years, failed. Therefore, we have to preserve the, 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 the security and military establishments of Syria, regardless of who is going to be president, the next president. And then number six is the principle of power sharing. Like Iran, the US agreed on Afghanistan in Bonn conference in 2001. In Afghanistan, the majority, they were Pashtun, Sunni, president and minority, Tajik, Farsi, Persians, uh, I mean, uh, the second level, it was a power sharing. Like practically Iran and the US, they have agreed on Iraq, uh, Shia majority, prime minister, president is a court, speaker of parliament is, is uh, Sunni, it should be power sharing. And then, <clears throat> The will of majority. Assad must stay, Assad must go. It is none of the business of any regional or international powers. This is really the business of Syrian nation to decide about their future. I mean, the notion of Assad is a red line, should stay, or Assad must go, is totally baseless and very dangerous. Number eight is the rights uh, of uh, minorities and the immunity for minorities in Syria. It's very important because like Alawites, they are minority and they are afraid about the future. Number nine is free election, to agree on a real free election to supervise by United Nations Security Council for the Syrian nation to decide 
And number 10 is a package like the U.S. Marshall Plan for Europe after the Second World War. We really need a Marshall Plan for, uh, for, for Syria on first the humanitarian issues about the refugees and about the re reconstruction of Syria. This is the 10 points I believe if the key regional international powers they agree at the beginning as the end state and then they can go ahead and then that would be face saving for all. To my understanding, the most important issue for Iranians in to prevent the expansion of the radical Wahhabist, Salafist, jihadi groups in the region, which they are not only uh, the enemy of Shia, even they have massacred more moderate Sunnis than more Shia, and they are against Europe, against the West, they are against all, you know. And they, the, 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 the uh, ISIS, claiming caliphate, an Islamic state, all countries they should be member of this Islamic, and a person like al-Baghdadi should, should uh, uh, lead the countries. This is the most dangerous concept, which they have hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the ground in Iraq, Syria, Nigeria, South Africa, North Africa, uh, Middle East, everywhere. This is the key issue. If you are going to have a moderate like Karzai in Afghanistan, you remember? Karzai had a good relation with Saudi Arabia, with the US, with Russia, with Iran, although he was Sunni or Pashtun. Iran was supporting, was helping Karzai to bring stability. I think um, the common understanding in Iran was definitely the U.S. is after regime change in Iran. Definitely the U.S. is after bringing a collapse in Iran. Because of the U.S. supported the Saddam invasion, the U.S. supported the use of chemical weapons against Iran, the U.S. imposed um, unilateral, multilateral sanctions, covert war, cyber war, assassination of nuclear scientists, because of many issues. But in the second term of Obama, when Obama started to publicly, officially say, the regime change is not my policy. And then said, I'm ready to negotiate with Iran on every issue directly without precondition. And then negotiated with Iran and respected the legitimate rights of Iran for enrichment and heavy water, for peaceful nuclear technology, on their non-proliferation treaty, only wanted Iran to give every guarantee about uh, no nuclear bomb, and about the, the, the highest level of transparency, then a part of Iranians, I cannot say all, either in the, the, the officials or in public, they started to rethink whether the US is going to be more realistic, more friendly with Iran, whether the US is coming forward for a real negotiation, to resolve decades of differences, to respect the, 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 the legitimate rights of Iran in the region, and then to go for further cooperation for regional issues and so on, so on, so You remember beyond the nuclear, we had some other cooperations when immediately 16 uh, American sailors, they were freed when they uh, entered illegally the Iranian water territory. You remember the exchange of prisoners, you remember the peaceful solution on financial dispute between Iran and the U.S. after 30, 40 years. And today, uh, I mean, uh, just some days ago, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, Boeing uh, contract with the Iranians uh, to sell 60 Boeings. These were, uh, uh, could be game changer. But when Trump came, during election, 
Trump made some, some, some statements creating hopes. He said, I would not go after regime change in any country. It was good. He said, my priority would be ISIS and terrorism. I don't care about Assad or so. But after presidential election, when he went to office, he started Iran policy by new sanctions. And the Congress is preparing for more sanctions. And then the Muslim ban issue, actually preventing 80 million Iranians to visit the US to come to see the, fam the, the, the relatives. Therefore, now again, uh, we have a backward. Iranian public and the administration now, they are almost united that Trump is against Iran. Definitely it affects because then they would try to uh, uh, resist American policy, not only in Syria, all region. It doesn't matter whether this is Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria, they would not cooperate.